Stories Lab that we're doing in collaboration with Creative Pinellas. I'm your host, Lisa Kirshner. You know me from the show. Yes. Hi. It's so nice to have you here. Um, Thank you for having me. So it's very interesting, Ruben, because you're a spoken word artist. And one of the things that I love about your stories and that I still recall some of those crazy details um, from your 7-Eleven, your tale of just working there on kind of a random night, or was it a New Year's? I don't, that much I don't remember, but mm -hmm. you know, th there were a lot of evocative details. Right. And um, I was so excited when you agreed to come on and tell a story. Um, I'm going to get, I'm going to get into some of what's exciting that's coming up for you, like the new album release, after you tell a story. So without really anything further from me, Ruben Drew with We Called Her Bug Girl. The handwritten sign was taped with invisible tape uh, on the front of the door, and the sign said, if you are sick, don't even think about entering. And don't even think was underlined like three times where you could tell that pressure was put down on the pen when that sign was being made. This is the front door of a place called Our Bar. It still exists um, it's a, as far as I know. And it's a place that my wife and I found to hang out because we didn't know anybody there. And that was perfect for us. That's exactly what we wanted. But I mention it because that sign, this is the early days uh, back when this whole pandemic was uh, just kind of a distant rumble, okay? We were hearing about it. There hadn't been any shutdowns, but people were starting to take some precautions and things like that. So here's this sign, and it struck me because it's very writing on the wall, very uh, the end is nigh, you know, written on uh, exposed brick or something in blood, right? Uh, it was that kind of sort of prophetic warning. Uh, and it's funny when you think about it. I mean, that was maybe, maybe four months ago, if that. Um, and we just had no idea. It was a completely different world then. And it was a place like this uh, that we met Bug Girl. Uh, and we met her, I want to say, about a, a, a year and a half prior. And Bug Girl, uh, she's short. Uh, she was maybe five foot tops. Um, she had kind of a crescent moon face and uh, she wore glasses like a bookish person would, re would, would wear glasses, right? Um, and I thought that maybe Bug Girl, it was just a name that my wife loves giving nicknames and that was her nickname. And I thought that maybe because of her stature, that would be maybe a pejorative term for her. But actually she was an entomologist, uh, an actual professional real life entomologist, right? She studied bugs, flies, lice, beetles, all of that. And the first time we met, uh, we were at a bar and I think we had all struck up some sort of conversation due to a mutual uh, admiration of let's say a DJ that was playing or something. And my first interaction with her was my wife had gotten up to go to the bar and someone had asked me, where she was. And I said, oh, she, she's gone to the bathroom. And Bug Girl comes to me and she's like, if you had been listening, you would know that she's at the bar and not the bathroom. And that just burnt my butt so bad. I was so, uh, I, I was so displeased with her and had a very, very bad um, initial uh, reaction, initial impression with her. Uh, about a couple uh, weeks later, you know, she and my wife struck up a great friendship. So I have to see her again. And uh, this time we're at the David Bowie uh, tribute night where the DJ is playing uh, 70s rock and everything that surrounded the whole Bowie scene. And there's a song by, uh, by T-Rex called 20th Century Boy. And it's a type of song that right at the first riff, you know what song it is. Um, and if you love it, you get excited. And right when that first riff came on, she and I locked eyes and we just threw our hands in the air and began just rocking out to 20th Century Boy by T-Rex. And at that point I realized, okay, this girl, she at least knows a little something. She might be, she might be cool, right? Um, we ended up having conversation later as a group and we brought up that first interaction and we agreed that it was probably an attempt at humor that was either poorly delivered or poorly received. Uh, so we, we, we struck up a friendship and she, came, she became one of my dearest friends. Um, 
And my wife is, uh, she's very passionate about teaching. And uh, one thing, one exchange that happened was she told my wife that uh, and she was about to go into surgery because bug girl, um, she, ha she had significant uh, issues with health. Uh, I think uh, surrounding perhaps her kidneys, perhaps her endocrine system. But she told my wife, she's like, you are very passionate about teaching. And what my passion is to love as much as long as I can, which, you know, it, it seemed to indicate to me that she, that she knew that she, she may not be long for this earth or, uh, or that she had the type of, of, of condition that, you know, did not result in, in, you know, a, a long life. So fast forward to the pandemic, it hits hard everything shut down. And one thing we realized while we were shut down, and we, we are very good with the shutdown and the self-quarantine, we are in and we entertain ourselves and we make it happen. But we realized that we realize the people that matter to us the most because they are the ones that we begin to think about more and more, the ones that we miss, the more, when this is over, I want to see this person. And Bug Girl was at the top of the list every time. So, not only do we deal with this quarantine, but then the world just erupts in socio-political strife. Uh, and then a depression starts to set in with me. I start to uh, experience episodes of uh, when I feel an emotion coming on, whether it be crying, whether it be just anger, screaming. And usually when you he feel that coming up, I can control it, you know? And this is the first time I've realized that it's, I can't control it. It's not controllable anymore. Um, I see a scene uh, on the news or something and it starts to come up and there's, and I, I simply can't stop. So what eventually happens is uh, Bug Girl, uh, she goes in for um, a, I, think, I believe it's a follow-up for a kidney transplant. Um, and she survives and she, she gives us the thumbs up picture on Facebook and that's great to see and we're so happy. Uh, but then um, it is not too long after that, uh, during the quarantine that I do receive the news that she had passed away. Uh, she had a heart attack and, and didn't uh, survive it. And I walk out into the living room, it's in the morning, uh, it's right before work and I, I give the news to my wife and I mean for it to be very matter of fact. We're dealing with a lot. My life currently, uh, my emotions are kind of a house of cards right now as I'm dealing with everything that's happening. Uh, and I go back into the bedroom to prepare to go to work, shower, get clothes, that sort of thing. And I just sit down and I play a song by uh, a group called Room 13 because I use music to deal, you know, to calm myself down and, and deal with things. And um, there's a, a line in a song uh, called Hurricane. And the line says, uh, all the fruit flies drown in the wine, waiting for signs of the sunshine. And that affected me because that's what we're all doing. We're waiting for signs of the sunshine, of the sunrise. We're waiting for this to be over. Um, and again, once this is over, she was the person we wanted to see. Uh, so that's when it, it all just crashed down uh, and I just bawled my eyes out. I bawled my eyes out, which I never do. Um, I was hoping my wife wouldn't hear, but I'm in the back in, in, in the bedroom and she comes out and she sees me, and she comforts me. Um, but that breakdown for me, it was a breakdown because again, I'm a very stoic person. I don't, you know, I'm not like that, but uh, it happened, um, but it was a purge. And all of those things, uh, having fallen out of me during that process, um, it renewed me. It renewed me. I, I, I found that I was able to control my emotions more now. Um, when any, I was able to organize things, look at the bright side of things, and just understand that uh, I'm not going to return to the world that I left. It's going to be a different world, and uh, that helped me kind of deal with that. Uh, and not too long after that, um, I saw a video and it was of a little girl and she was bawling her eyes out because the ice cream truck had to shut down due to, uh, due to COVID. And it was at that point that I realized, you know, I was okay, but I also realized that to date, looking at that girl, 
uh, bawling her eyes out. I had never connected with another human at such a fundamental point in my life. And that's what we call her bunk girl. When did this all happen? And by the way, I'm sorry for your loss. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say she passed three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, like I say, I've known her probably about a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, yeah. It has happened recently. Yeah. And um, did you get to go to her funeral by chance? Um, well, due to COVID, no. So they didn't do like a Zoom funeral? I mean, I have to be honest with you. I've been to some Zoom funerals that are super powerful, really yeah. powerful. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't uh, attend anything. They didn't do a Zoom. Yeah, it's rough. But it wasn't, it, and it, the, the thing is, is that it doesn't sound like her death was COVID related. The no. heart attack. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we're waiting. Yeah. And, that, and I think that's really just the, the flavor that I felt was, you know, we were, we were just waiting. We were just waiting for this to be done, you know? And then, you know, and not like, you know, she, you know, failed to meet a goal or something. She didn't make it to the finish line. Finish line. Um, you know, but I didn't make the finish line. I didn't get to meet, to see her again, so. We were waiting for this, meaning you, ever since you sort of started to get to know her and became familiar with her health issues, you kind of knew that she was gonna pass away early young, I guess I should say. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's so sad. Where was the last time you think you saw her? Um, uh, we were at a concert. And I want to say it's like, uh, at um, Crowbar in Ybor City, or it may have been the castle. I think I may have seen their last at the castle. Yeah. But. I remember that Bowie. I remember when that Bowie night was. Mm. Uh, it's just interesting because I, I also remember the last time, you know, one of the last times I was out with any gathering of people was actually the true stories in March. Um, I don't remember what date that was, like March 8th or something, March 10th, somewhere around there. Oh, God, this is never going to end, it feels like. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I do, I, you know, I do like a lot of the, a lot of the details. It's always such a delicate balance, you know, when you're telling mm -hmm. a story. How do you find storytelling different from spoken word? Uh, well, I tell you, my first foray into it was the true stories. Um, and what I actually did was, you know, I, what I read at true stories, uh, that was my- There's no reading. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sorry. The story that I told was the story of my experience at 7-Eleven. But my experience at 7-Eleven did turn into a poem that was very successful uh, for me in the 90s. Hmm. And, um, and, and when I, you know, I looked into the whole true story thing and I realized, hey, you know, this needs to be a story. You're not doing a poem. You're going to tell a story of how this happened. So that was really my first foray into it. And I remember, and, and I, I almost know exactly the point that you're talking about when it was like, uh-oh, he's going to do some spoken word, because I felt myself falling right back into that. And like, I'm starting to gesticulate and I'm starting to do all of this blocking on stage. And, and I pulled back and I was like, okay, stop. You're not a comedian. <laughs> you're not a poet. You're just telling this story. So make it conversational. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, I could feel it just all just going right into that muscle memory. And with storytelling, that that's a challenge you know for someone who has a background in spoken word or, or theater or something like that you know mm -hmm. um and, it, and it's an interesting and it, it's it's a great challenge and i love doing it what i love is because i'm i don't have a performing background i have a writing background and i just love the opportunity to um kind of bring stories to the fore and figure out how they uh the, how the narrative moves more successfully and you can really tell that from your audience reaction you can you can really tell um i think when you get on a stage and you tell a story you you very quickly see what people are kind of like going like shaking their heads at or what they're you know laughing at or nodding at like you get a you get a sense there's an exchange that happens that helps you mold the narrative to make it um uh uh 
more, what's the word I want to use? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't change the facts of the story, right? But it, it, it definitely changes the telling, the telling changes. You know, when I'm in um, New York, I can tell, I can tell a different kind of story. I would tell a story differently than I might tell it here in St. Petersburg, just because of the sensibility of the audience, right? I mean, for one yeah. thing, audiences are older here, generally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So, you know, they might not get some references and they'll get others. They will get others. So it's just, it's, it's always interesting. And you can tell quickly when you're talking to an audience. Um, yeah. And I've never done spoken word. And I, I mean, spoken word is basically memorizing and then saying, isn't that right? It's, you're, there's no ad libbing. There's no improv. Right. Except um, now, if you've written something and uh, just like in acting or anything, if oh my goodness, I blinked this line, you need to be ready to <laughs> to fill that and and to you know maybe go off extemporaneously a little bit. But um, yeah, generally it's you know memorization and, and performing. Right. But then yeah. with that ability to, to to riff if you need to. Right. Have you had that experience? Yes. Yes, I'll say that. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've performed a lot, uh, many different locations in Orlando, uh, and then over here in St. Petersburg. So, you know, having done it for so long, um, you're going to find yourself in those situations sometimes, where especially with a newer piece or something like that, uh, you know, you just, because I, I, I'm very strict about not having the, the aid with me. I don't want to read it off of a paper. I don't want to have a phone in front of me and read it. Right. Um, I want right. to here and yeah you know, and then like when I was young young um, I did a lot of theater so same type of thing uh, you, you, you memorize lines but sometimes you might lose a block or you may get a bad cue from someone else um, and you need to cover that and, right. it, yeah, and it, it just takes years of of doing it and doing it and doing it um, for it to be but yes it, it, it is a, a big part of the of the performance experience right and have you changed poems much based on performance experience? Uh, yes, yes I have. Um, perhaps more um, my writing choices as I, as I continue. Um, you know, okay, so these poems were written like this and I got this type of feedback. I'm going to now form my method, you know, to be a little bit more palatable to the audience, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Right. That sort of thing. So how did it come to be that you're doing um, this album with Goon, Squ Goon Squad Music? That's actually hard to say. It doesn't seem like it when you read it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, is that all you on Do Not Stop or is it a, is it a collective of artists? Uh, it's all me. I'm doing the spoken word. Um, I'm doing uh, music accompan accompaniment to that. Um, I do have... Oh, you're doing uh, the music as well? You're doing the whole thing? Wow. What do you play? Um, it's all electronic, so loops. Um, I there is some stringed instruments. There's some sitar in there. There's some um, you know some uh, Indian chanting. So actually, I'm sorry, Punjabi chanting from a friend of mine, um, and we just all put it together. Are I'm you Punjabi. It. I am not. No. Oh, okay. I'm not. Where are you from? Uh, my father's black. He's from Washington D.C. Uh, my mother's from Thailand. And I was born in DC um, and then moved to Florida probably in the mid eighties. It's interesting. I never think of um, this. I think of the sitar as Indian, which is Asian, but not Thai. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I, I just, I just prefer the sound. <laughs> I love the sound of a sitar. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. I um, created, and it, it's been a long time in in coming um so i want to say several years ago uh it was just a a combination of, of a lot of different influences um i w had the wonderful opportunity to open for lydia lunch um oh, in 2000s yeah. well. and well and uh, you know i performed before she did and then i met her in the back uh, and you know she said i love your work don't stop what you're doing yeah. and that's probably why I'm still doing this right now. You know, I, I could have, you know, dismissed it as child's play a long time ago, but, you know, she gave me some encouraging words. Um, and then it's just the idea of do not stop because uh, part of my writing process uh, gets halted a lot due to just self-editing, so second guessing, uh, you know, 
and, and I realized I just need to sometimes just regurgitate and, and edit afterwards, you know, and it's hard for me to do that. So just do not stop, keep writing, keep doing it. And I found that even though that is one of the focal points of the project, um, it's still been super difficult and it's still taken a, a long time, even though I, I consciously made the effort to, to plow through it basically. Um, and then one other thing, you know, when I was courting my wife, uh, she lived in Orlando, I lived in St. Petersburg. And so we do a lot of driving back and forth. And on the, uh, the toll on the expressway, um, there's a sign that tells you, don't stop, just go through the toll and it'll read your, your e-pass. Oh yeah. And it just says, do not stop in capital letters. Um, each word has its own strata on the sign. And it was almost like a Zen cone to me. You know? <laughs> so all of those together said, okay, you know, you need to do a project. Right. Yeah. It's a great, and it's, I mean, I think it's true for any kind of artwork. You just, you just keep doing it. That's the uh, secret to um, longevity is to not stop. <laughs> Notice I didn't say success. Success, I right. think, is a very arbitrary um, measure. What is success, after all? Yeah, no. Not stopping, I think. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. So that's what I was thinking about this fall. Uh, do, you, or do you have any performances planned that you can even talk about? I mean, it's like, I think everything is a little bit on tinter hooks, but. Certainly, certainly. I mean, not really. I mean, I plan to buy a ticket to. Uh, to the nostalgia true stories so <laughs> oh excellent oh so you do you have a story you're going to tell yeah well and here's the thing let me let me talk to you about this <laughs> i look because i i love prompts i think any writer loves to work with prompts and that's one thing that i like about the true stories is that okay there's a prompt right and then so uh you know the, the work prompt was awesome because i knew exactly where to go with that um nostalgia uh, that's, I love that. I love that. So, um, I, that's going to be a prompt. I'm going to, you know, raid my memory banks for something that has to do with that. And I'm going to tell a story on it. Um, me too. But the, see, now the way that that prompt came to be was I was speaking to Charles Sanchez, who, um, has actually been a longtime collaborator of mine, um, on various projects. And, uh, he, wanted he had a story that he was thinking about that was that had to do with 80s like falling in love in the 80s and um we just did a love theme so i was like how about nostalgia because he, you know he, he well he was talking about he was talking about how evocative the 80s are for him as a as an era and i was like well how about nostalgia and uh so yeah i think it's gonna be a fun show um, he's a very fun teller for one thing, very entertaining. He has a, in fact, he was my first sort of acting coach. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he's got a musical theater background, so he's a great performer. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So it's just that. And then, um, you know, um, I'm in the final mixing stages of the album that'll be out in the fall. And, but no performances scheduled. None around the release mm -hmm. well hopefully i mean hopefully that will be possible fingers crossed um but you know it could always end up being a even a zoom performance you know mm -hmm. for what it for what it's worth i mean at least when we have this kind of an interaction we can see each other while we're talking right um mm -hmm. so you know there's that with, have you been to True Stories since they've been virtual yet? You have not. Wait, I, ha I did one True Stories. You were I did the first one. one. Yeah. So, you, you know, with the gallery view, I like to keep it in gallery view so that way I can see everybody. So I still feel like we're all together in the room. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, and it works because then you see people responding while you're telling, which to mm -hmm. me is an important, that feedback loop is, like I was saying before, is really is really important. It helps me know and it is with regard to details that you include what is landing and what isn't landing. Like if yeah. I say, you know, it smelt like Aoud, I can tell if the people sort of go like, like they have no idea that that is a, is a uh, classic Middle Eastern incense scent, right? So then I will say, which is sort of like, 
uh, uh, patchouli and cinnamon. It is delicious mix. <laughs> Which patchouli and cinnamon might sound kind of gross, but but I, really when you put it together, it's, it's delicious. I don't know. How do you spell that? How do you spell the name of that? Oud, I spell it O-U-D, but I'm not 100% sure if that's correct. Um, a lot of, uh, what's the word? I mean, not a lot of, all words in Arabic language are alliterative, right? So, because they have a different alphabet. So um, there are some things I, I just make up spelling for in my own head. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's correct or not, but I don't know that, but nobody has a correct spelling. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I wrote my book about living there, I would defer to sort of common media spelling for words like abaya and shayla and things like that, just because. Um, but those are words that you see, like there are other words you just don't ever see. So, Ruben, I'm really excited. I'm excited for your forthcoming album. I love the idea behind it. If you had words of wisdom besides do not stop to a, a young um, artist who, who loves words and um, uh, creating moods, what would you tell them? I would say take yourself seriously. Um, so uh, we, we idolize those that have, that have made it. Um, if you're doing it, you've made it, <laughs> you know? If you're doing it, you've made it. So take yourself seriously. I love it.